Senator Rand Paul uh, becomes the first Republican to come out against a ban of TikToks. He says he will defend the app. But my next guest says innovation is national defense. Joining me now, Pomp Investments investor Anthony Pompliano. Uh, Pomp, you know, I, I saw your comment on TikTok being weaponized uh, against the United States. And, to, and, and of course, to think of the ban as, as, as in that point, the innovation is a national, as, as national defense. I, I guess it's not unusual for Rand Paul to take that position, but I think most people, at least most folks who understand what's at stake, probably believe a, a ban is, is what's, what we should be doing, right? Well, look, I think you got to separate out both the ban and then this idea of innovation as national defense, right? Uh, everyone's focused on the current moment, and we should be and we should address it. It's very obvious that uh, we basically have two concerns. One, the dumbing down of an entire generation of children, but also a lot of data and privacy issues that we got to get to uh, the bottom of. But I'm more concerned about how do we prevent this in the future? And I think that's where innovation comes in. You know, in this country, we have this idea that uh, things just get better. But I actually think that this is a wake up call to the tech industry, to the education industry and to the American government. Right. We need to better train, educate our people. We need to encourage entrepreneurship and we need to compete in the free market. And the next great social app that gets created, we should hope that Americans do it. That's based here in the U.S. and it'll negate these types of issues moving forward. But innovation is absolutely critical to the national defense of this country, but it's also critical to the economic prosperity of this country. And I think the more that we can focus on competing, stop complaining and compete get our people building the best products, the best technology, stop trying to uh, slow down innovation, encourage it, and I think we'll be in a better position. Yeah, I'm with you one million, one million percent. Uh, ironically, you know, we, we might have lost sight of creative destruction. I want to uh, also take it out to, to Bitcoin because it's above 28,000, really, really building a nice head of steam here. In a more perfect world, how could Bitcoin have played a role in, in helping to avoid or mitigate the current banking crisis? Yeah, look, I think understanding what's going on in the banking world is important. Uh, the fractional reserve system obviously induces risk, um, and people need to be aware of the risk that they're taking. Now, FDIC insurance and many other things have been put in place help to mitigate that. I don't think we want to live in a world where individuals or small businesses are having to underwrite the solvency of the banks that they're putting their deposits in. Um, and so I think fractional reserve is what it is. Uh, we have systems in place to mitigate it. But what we just saw was there are millions, if not tens or hundreds of millions of people who just woke up to how fractional reserve banking works. Yeah. Bitcoin was in the you know ashes of the last great financial crisis. I believe we're in a financial crisis right now. Uh, and Bitcoin ends up not only being a solution to that problem, but I think Bitcoin also represents this idea of actually lowering risk, which is very important. Every single asset in the world induces risk. And so when you look at something like treasuries, I mean, these banks were buying things that were supposed to be some of the safest assets in the world. When you buy a home, there's risk. That's why you buy insurance. When you cross the street, there's risk. But an asset like Bitcoin that is programmatic, not controlled by anyone, and continues to build out the most decentralized computing network in the world, that actually, in my mind, reduces risk. And so yeah. if somebody is trying to be conservative and they want to store their wealth for the next 20, 50, 100 years, there's very few assets in the world that I have more confidence in than Bitcoin. And so I think that people should just take the time to learn about it. You know, it's really amazing, too, to your point. Uh, at this moment in time, over the last few months, the last few weeks, uh, you know, Bitcoin, I think, to your, to your point, is making that case more than ever. Uh, you all posted a Bloomberg cover I thought was pretty intriguing, right? Powell trying to beat inflation on one hand to save the banks at the same time. Listen, I think he's made a mess of things. But the Federal Reserve, I mean, where do you see its role? It just, to me, it's just too powerful, Pomp. And, and I think they're just going to keep making things worse. Yeah, look, I tend to be someone who thinks that market intervention actually makes things more complex. Uh, it ends up throwing off the free market. And so uh, ultimately, I decide that the free market is probably the better referee. Now, with that said, we have to be realistic. We live in a system where there is a central bank. Uh, the Federal Reserve does have a lot of influence, uh, especially when they intervene. And I think we have to also be honest with ourselves. I don't want that job. Right. I don't envy the position that they're in because it is nearly an impossible situation. You have to intervene. If you are a politician or a central banker, you're going to mitigate short term risk, whether that's the right decision or not over the long term. You're going to mitigate that short term risk, which they did in 2020. And so naturally, those market interventions throw off the free market. They yeah. end up complicating stuff. And now what we have is a situation where I do think that cover is correct. Save the banks or save the dollar. And so if we have six percent inflation, a very key metric that people kind of have forgotten, we, through quantitative tightening, took almost a trillion dollars off the central bank's balance sheet. Right. We raised interest rates to 5%. Inflation is still at 6% in the official reading. 
So we threw everything we had at it. We never got inflation below 6%, and now we're expanding the balance sheet again, likely going to drop interest rates over the next year or so. I don't see inflation necessarily having an easy ride back yeah. to 2%. Yeah. So well, it just ends up being what it is. They're probably going to, I really, I don't know why they are so stuck on 2%. I think they should make it 3%. And to your point, they put so much money in the system. You can't take it out overnight, no matter what you do. Take it slow road. Maybe we would have less of these uh, wild gyrations. Hey, it's so good to have you on, Pomp. Anthony, thank you so much.